Today's event is hosted by Digital.gov's Web Managers Community of Practice. And the Web Managers Community has been working together for over 20 years. Our first meeting was held on October 1st, 2000. And we work to improve the content and usability of US government websites. And we're a community of government employees, federal, state, and local, who share ideas, challenges, and lessons learned to manage and improve the content on government websites and other channels. As Alex mentioned, I'm Amy Fraj Fejo. I'm a co-lead of the Web Managers community. And I also work on the US Web Design System team at the General Services Administration. I've been working in the federal digital space since about 2005 uh, in several roles over the past 15 years. Today, we're going to talk about using chatbots and other virtual assistants to improve customer experience. And I'm thrilled to be joined by a cross agency panel who is going to talk about their experiences with chatbots and other virtual assistants. Janice Burrell from the Transportation Security Administration Marietta Jelks from the USA.gov team at GSA, and Abraham Marinez from the Federal Student Aid at Department of Education. So we will kick it off with a few demos, then follow with a panel discussion and open the floor to your questions for about 20 to 30 minutes at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Janice, to talk about how TSA chose artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Janice Burrell, and I am the social media manager for TSA. I wanted to chat with you all a little bit about why TSA actually uh, chose artificial intelligence and how we got there. So let's just start with why we would even want artificial intelligence. As you can see, Ask TSA is a part of our social media strategy. And Ask TSA's goal is basically to be able to respond to the traveling public with travel related questions and ease the burden of the TSO at the checkpoint. Um, as you can see here, we answer on an average of about 2000 questions a day and I only have a staff of 10 people. So there is the problem. As you can see here, our growth has been going up. Um, this only goes back to I think 2015, yeah, the 2015 since we started. Um, we've had a couple of spikes um, this one in particular was when uh, President Trump decided to tweet on Ask TSA um, during the government shutdown. So we had a lot to talk about there. And you can see we get our dips. This dip here is normal. It would be basically due to the, uh, the time of year. And then we started to go up and things were really good. And this is where we added the bot. And you can see that uh, the volume almost was as much as it was when we got this outlier before. Here's where COVID hit. And oddly enough, even though the volume, travel volume went down, STSA's volume only went down for a quarter and then it shot back up. So with this type of growth, we needed to figure out how we could keep up with the response time that we wanted to maintain. So in doing some research, I was at a uh, briefing and everybody knows email is about dead. You know, you could argue back and forth all day long on if chats or messaging is, you know, which one is better. But the thing that stuck out for me was this artificial intelligence. So again, I decided this was time for me to really look into what I could do with artificial intelligence and what could be answered by artificial intelligence that didn't need a, a person to answer. So we broke down um, our, our questions that we get to see what it was that was redundant that came in a lot. As you might expect, prohibited and permitted items, what can I bring through the checkpoint was huge. And TSA pre-check was huge. TSA pre-check questions take a lot of time for us. So we knew eventually those questions would have to come to the agent for us to be able to answer but prohibited and permitted, uh, that's pretty easy. So then we came up with a grid. And in this grid, um, and I apologize if it's hard to see, but in this grid, what it basically tells you is, is the percent of questions that I'm getting in each of these categories, this being pre-check with 11%, uh, prohibited and per permitted items is, I believe, I have to look, sorry, 36%. 
and we broke it down. And then we talked about what could be answered immediately, not having too many clicks, but get the answers to immediately. And we found that there were pre-check questions that could be answered or questions that could be asked to the customer before it came over to us to answer. And then it prohibited and permitted an IDs, these green uh, boxes or circles, that is the bot can answer those 100%. So here's what it looks like today. If you were to go to Twitter or go to uh, Facebook Messenger and go to Ask TSA, you're going to get my bot. And because we wanna be forthcoming with our audience, we tell them immediately, we're a bot and you're talking to a bot. And just to give us a little plug on when you can talk to a person, we add our, our hours there, noting that the bot works 24 seven, but the people don't, we let them go home. So um, for this presentation, we're gonna talk about ID. And so let's say the person has a question about identification. They would then click here and the bot says, now, what do you wanna know about? identification? Is it what IDs are accepted? Is it damaged IDs? Uh, is it expired IDs? And there's a whole little list here that you could go over. But if you wanted to know about accepted IDs, here's your answer. So not only do we give you the answer to the question, but we also give you a link where you can go visit our website or a blog or whatever we've decided at that point that can give you more information if you should have questions. At the end of this, each customer is giving a, a CSAT score, or excuse me, given a CSAT survey or customer service customer service satisfaction um, score survey, so that then we will know what job we've done with the bot, which is totally separated uh, from the, the CSAT that we get for our employees. Um, and that is my short overview of Ask TSA's bot. Thanks, Janice. Marietta, I'm curious, uh, how was your experience with the USA.gov different or similar to Janice and TSA? Um, thanks, thanks for this opportunity. Um, there are some similarities and some differences. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I think, first of all, their purpose is a little different than ours. They recognize a serious deficiency in human resources to answer all these questions and um, the volume of questions. Um, ours was more so we wanted to pilot the opportunity of using artificial intelligence in some way. USA.gov um, answers questions across the spectrum of government, local government, state government, federal government programs. And we wanted to see if there was a way to curtail or you know siphon off a portion of them, but it was not this sense that there were humans actually answering them necessarily and that we were trying to curtail that, but just giving it away as an opportunity to, to discover and explore if uh, AI was a good solution for us. Um, I think a few things that she said, said stood out to me. First of all, she mentioned that when you use their chatbot that you say, I am a chatbot and ours follows that same structure. We say, I'm the USA.gov chatbot um, to let it be known that we're not a human person, that this is not you know real life, but at the same time that we're here to help you. Um, we also use, uh, similar to the chat bot that Janice showed us, we use buttons to help people navigate through versus um, natural language processing or machine learning sort of capabilities. We've programmed some answers some for the top tasks that people have um, to get them to their questions. And so, and we, after some research, we determined those top tasks that people wanted to do. So Janet, we did some similar research um, to determine that. And I'll just kind of click through um, and help people navigate to the, will you work? Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, navigate to potential answers. Um, and we use, again, the most common scams or potential areas that people reached out to us about and got them to the answer. Okay. Um, unlike Janice, where their answers are pretty much internal to TSA because they are the, the subject matter expert. We're not the subject matter expert on scams. And so we're normally pointing people out um, to another agency for scams is often their state consumer protection office or the FTC. And so we have um, a lot of, we do include links to how to file a complaint um, for here. The Federal Trade Commission is the answer. Um, 
and and getting people to the answer that they want. But it's again external. And then we do ask a question. We don't have the CSAT score; it's not tied to that. But we do have this question about if people are satisfied. We have not had as much success with people answering that question as we hoped, because once they get the answer they want, they jet. They don't, you know, stick around to answer that. Did we help you question? Um, but it's still something that we try to use. Um, and I think one other thing, distinction between our version versus the one that TSA has offered is that ours is just really on our website. We have it on three of the USA.gov pages in English and two on Spanish. Whereas um, the one that they're offering is on social media platforms through the messenger capabilities um, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and so ours, our placement is a different um, decision. So we, I think the, the logic of using decision tree, of using top um, challenges or concerns that are easy to answer without a lot of human interaction um, are the same, but I think just our placement is different and um, the, the desire to explore AI for us was the impetus versus um, trying to really stop this huge um, overload of calls or, or messaging. Marietta. Sure. Abraham, uh, what was the impetus for federal student aid to invest in a 24 seven digital engagement tool? Or any other question you'd like to bounce off of from what Marietta and Janice just mentioned? I think we all share this, the same common desire to help our citizens find answers to the questions. I think our approach might be slightly different, but I think the end goal is to, is to serve citizens and get answers to the frequently asked questions. Um, yes, so let me dive in a little bit into talk about kind of our approach around a virtual system. But before I do that, let me just give a little context for the group on kind of who we are. We are federal student, federal student aid, an office within the US Department of Education. And we are the agency commonly known as folks think we're the folks that uh, provide FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid or student loans. But we are the nation's largest provider of student financial assistance for higher aid. We disperse our rough around $120 billion of student financial aid every year. We have a portfolio of roughly 45 million um, borrows with a student loan portfolio of $1.5 trillion. So again, we are the primary resource for um, student parents and borrowers who are interested in financing their higher education. So the, with that said, what was our impetus here? So, as you guys heard, it's about providing that service to our customers. We, just like many other agencies, have contact centers. And we wanted to provide our citizens, our customers, with other options instead of being beholden to the hours of operation to our, customer, to our contact centers. We roughly get around 2 million inquiries per month. And we looked at ways like how do we provide um, our customers with more self-service options and are able to provide and answer some of the frequently asked questions. So as we were brainstorming and thinking through some of our strategic initiatives, we said, hey, let's see if we can use AI to augment our contact center, not to completely replace it, but to augment our, 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 um, our contact centers and our live agents. And by doing that, we worked in, in defining the goals for our first uh, step at um, tackling a virtual assistant. So the first goal here is first and foremost, we want to provide a world-class customer-centric virtual assistant, which is deployed on our website. It's deployed on our mobile app, which is coming on later this year. In our IVR, we actually are piloting that conversational IVR platform within our IVR. So we wanna make sure that through our uh, channels, digital, website, our mobile app, and through our IVR, that we are able to provide a, 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 uh, a chatbot where customers can get their responses. Another thing, our major goal was operational improvements. Again, increase that digital self-service to hopefully cut down on some of the costs coming into our contact centers. Third is to apply AI. This is the first time that we've ever tackled AI at the Department of Education. So there was something new. We knew the benefits of this. And as you guys heard from GSA and from TSA, there are some benefits to this. And we wanted to experiment. And then as we were doing this, we want to make sure that we were learning and we took a phase approach where we started small, we learned from our customers and then built and iterated our product every time we release in order to meet our customers' expectations. So with that said, 
Here's Aiden at a very high level is to promote self-service by answering frequently asked questions that customers have around our federal student aid program. So in this, an example here, um, Brian, he's looking to learn more about our public service loan forgiveness. And so we get these questions out of the contact center, like, how do I know, am I, you know if I'm eligible? What are the criteria to be eligible for PSLF? So with that said, Aiden, if you're asking that question and the approach we took was, um, you can just ask a question, you know, learn more about PSLF, learn more about public servant loan forgiveness. And Aiden is able to provide a concise response and also link back to our site. So that way they can get the full information, as you know, with government programs, it's not as simple as two to three sentences. We have a lot of content around our programs, directs them so that way the customer is not necessarily searching for on the site. They can do it as well, but if they're chatting with the chatbot, they get a direct link and access to more of the eligibility requirements in order to qualify for that program. So again, the desired outcome here is to the increase that digital self-service and hopefully decrease some of these um, costs of the contact center. So how does Aiden look like today? Uh, if you go to studentaid.gov, as of today, it's available to all users who log into the site. Later this year, Aiden's going to be available to anyone that, that goes to studentaid.gov. Again, we've taken a phase approach. We want to learn with a small group of the population. And if you sign in, you can actually get a personalized experience. You can ask them, what's my loan balance? And Aiden's able to tell you your loan balance or what's my next payment due. So similar to what, you, what, you, what you've seen with uh, TSA and GSA, it's a simple chat window. We do have buttons where again, they can follow a decision tree or how we call it guided conversational flows. But we also took the approach that we allow the customer to ask a question and then we figure out what they're trying to say in order to provide them with a response. As we were designing our virtual assistant, we want to make sure that again, I'm the product owner for Aiden, but I am also the product design group director. And I want to make sure that with anything that we do within federal student aid, that we're, we're applying human centered design principles, HCD, talking to our customers, doing testing, asking for feedback. As we were developing Aiden, and even after we launched Aiden, we were conducting usability testing to kind of learn from our customers. As you see here in the slide, we talked to, um, we did four rounds of testing. We had different type of customer base. We found roughly about 47 different findings and recommendations um, to help improve the product. And you see here some of the feedback that our folks provided. Some of them were good. Some of them were areas of opportunities where we could improve the service. And then right here, I want to share with you what are the current, we call it intent libraries and capabilities. As again, since we are providing federal student aid and um, folks have actual direct engagement with us, given that we are providing them with resources, money to attend institutions of higher education, um, you know, they take out student loans, they have grants. So a key thing is around account inquiry. If you have a relationship with a bank, for example, Bank of America, they have an Erica bot. And if you want to learn about your balance, you can ask that question. So we develop intents around account inquiry and there's a whole list here. Same thing about <clears throat> who, who is managing your loan. We call a servicer, you can do that. We also have a knowledge inquiry, which is around a variety of FAQs from learning about financial aid, applying for financial aid, and managing your student loans. Right now, we're currently under an administrative forbearance, as you guys probably already know, um, FSA is not collecting any student loan payments, but we do have a feature with some of our loan services that you actually can make a payment within aid. And you say make a payment, and if you're set up in the website with your debit information, we can actually make a payment through Aiden. And again, as you see here, we are integrated with the website. We're gonna be releasing with a mobile app. We do have the ability to connect you to um, our contact centers, listing them and providing a telephone number. And one cool thing that we did last year and hopefully to expand to our other contact center, we can actually do a warm transfer. If you have any questions and we call it the Student Loan Support Center, um, which typically handles some of the loan payment questions or loan counseling questions, um, we can actually transfer that particular chat to a live CSR agent. The CSR agent is able to see the transcript of the conversation and continue the conversation with our, um, you know, with the customer. So again, that integration from a bot hand warm transfer over to a live CSR agent. And then lastly, for FY20, some of our results, like how do we measure the success? Um, again, we started very small with the pilot. So for FY20, it's about adoption. Are people actually using it? One thing that we do with Aiden is that we don't force it on our users. They actually have to engage by seeing the little out icon on the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, of, of the webpage and actually click on it and actually type in a question. 
So roughly 545,000 users actually took those steps in order to engage with Aiden. We've roughly exchanged between Aiden and our customers 1.3 million messages. Um, in our first fiscal year, we did roughly around 50 plus changes working with this kind of pseudo agile approach. And then again, now, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are at 100% of users who log in, starting from only 10% back in December 2019, all the way to 100% in um, late last year. And again, sometime this year, we'll be providing it to all users. They don't need to log in in order to just ask their basic questions about financial aid. So that's the approach that we took with Aiden. And I um, hope this is something that folks um, can explore. I do believe that having a, a uh, a 24-7 digital self-service tool to our customers or to our citizens keeps us connected with them and allows them to kind of get answers to their questions. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been having a bunch of questions roll into the chat as you've all been talking. Uh, I know one question that we had talked about previously in um, preparing for the panel was how are you measuring success? Uh, Abraham, you had mentioned reduced uh, cost to the contact center. Uh, what other metrics or outcomes and how are you measuring that return on investment? Yeah, and, and let me chime in on that. And that's something that is still ongoing. Um, this is a new technology that we're implementing at FSA, and we're tr trying to tie it back to an ROI because, again, the whole thought, and as you probably have heard and what my panelists is, will say, and also vendors will also tell you if they're pushing their AI um, chatbot solutions, is that that's going to be a correlation where the bot's able to answer these questions, thus reducing the cost of the call centers, which tend to be more expensive. That is, at a very high level, true, and we're working on kind of measuring those costs. And again, the more questions Aiden can answer, the thought here is deflecting calls to the call center. What we're working is how to actually measure it. That's something that I'm currently working on because we do want to show ROI between the linkage of the bot and our contact centers. Janice or Marietta, do you have any additional insights on KPIs and, and measuring success? So this is Janice. Um, I do. So I'm measuring in, in a few different ways. One is, is, you remember I was talking about we needed more people in order to maintain um, our, our timeliness and answering the questions because let's face, face it, people are trying to get on a plane. What I neglected to tell you is that when we first started, when I was looking at this, we had an hour and a half wait time just to answer a question for someone who's standing in line at the airport. Sadly enough, by the time we would answer that question, most people were already in the on the plane and flying. It was too late. Now our time to reply and answer a question is less than two minutes. A lot of that is due to the bot. So I can measure success in that, number one, I don't have a wait time of hour and a half. You'd be very quick in getting your reply and can have a conversation with you while you're standing in line. And the second is, is that I was able to put a dollar value to it by determining how many agents I would need to answer those questions, which is about 30% of my daily uh, incoming questions. So how many agents would I need to answer those 30% of questions, which is about four? So I've been able to save myself from hiring four FTEs by having my artificial intelligence. So those are the two major ways that I look at it. And, and for our side, because ours is more so um, exploring the technology that was our main goal, we wanted to see if people were actually using it. And so we created a, a calculation of sorts using um, two pieces of data from our chatbot backend where we're looking at the people number of people who got to the final answer in the cycle divided by the total number of people who used it. So using that as a, as a guide, about 75% of the people who start the bot finish through and get a final answer. And we think that's really good. That's been really stable throughout the life of the bot, 71 to 75%. Um, and so we're seeing that most people are getting an answer to know where to file that complaint or if they can get their money back um, or, or to ascertain if what they've experienced is actually a scam. And that is, we think, um, we haven't done an official like study to see how many calls is prevented to our call center. Um, there's a natural correlation exactly, but we do sense that that is reducing the amount of volume 
of, of kind of simpler, lower hanging fruit questions that our call center is answering and they're able to do more nuanced calls. And another thing I'll add here too is ours, as I mentioned, adoption rate, but also handle rate. Is the bot actually able to understand whether it's a decision tree or free text? Is the bot able to understand and assign the appropriate intent and provide the, uh, the response? So I look at those metrics, but I think with folks also, as my panelists mentioned here, it's around the ROI, where again, instead of having multiple folks working, you can have the bot kind of clear some of those as I call it, tier one questions that are simple, thus reducing the burden on a human being, but also can you actually tie that back to the call center? That's something that I'm working on to figure out those metrics. How do we know if a response given by Aiden can deflect the call and the customer, we actually prevented a call to the contact center. So that's something that I'm still working on. I see another question in the chat that seems good to ask earlier on in our conversation, and that's, if an agency were to start designing a chatbot now, how do you suggest that they get started? I'll go. So, hi, it's Janice. So, there are many people out there or companies out there that will do chatbots for you. That's number one. You don't have to build it, you just have to buy it. Um, and that's from a TSA perspective. And that's what we did. By me doing that, I'm not integrated in any manner whatsoever with the internal TSA system, which means I didn't have to be get somebody who was fit ramp certified or go through any of that. It's a total separate entity to itself. So for me, that's grand. Um, and then the second thing is, is, I mean, I can tell you some of the companies, if you want to write to me after this, that we looked at that I know about, but you can just Google them. They are out there um, and each one is very close and then very different. So it's gonna be up to you to determine what it is that you're looking for and what your real need is. And as long as you know what your real need is, you go for that. And once you go for that, anything else you get is just a bonus and just extra. Yeah, and I completely agree with that approach. If, if, if you're not doing any type of integration, it's just you're gonna answer basic generic FAQs on whatever content you have on the site. Getting a COTS solution up and running, you know, depending on your agency's IT's uh, protocols, um, could be something that could be done, for, not say fairly quickly, but could be done at a fast pace. Now, the approach that we took at Federal Student Aid, given that we wanted to provide information about the customer's account, if they're asking for the loan balance, that required integration. So that means our solution had to be FedRAMP compliant. And there is not many, I don't think there's any, as when we, we started this back in late 2019, there weren't any uh, chatbot COT solutions that were FedRAMP compliant. So what we did in our approach is that we used the RASA open source NOU, natural language understanding. Think of it, we grabbed the app, we installed it in our FedRAMP compliant cloud, and we built our chatbot there. Pretty much all the backend, the NOU, the AI, everything was built um, within, um, we know within our FedRAMP compliant um, environment because we were connecting to a customer's account. So we took the approach of actually building our model, training it, and going with an open source tool in order to um, uh, build our chatbot. And even we were very low scale, low minimal viable product on our side. So, I mean, the questions we asked, you know, were what are the main questions that we want this chatbot to ask? Um, we did it in-house. So like I built the chatbot logic and like the language, you know, internally. So it was, do you have somebody on your team who is comfortable or able to create the logic of if this, then this, if this, then that on all the different response paths and then understanding, you know, what those, what the words and, you know, language will be to go with that. Um, also, I think it was very helpful. We had a cross-functional team. So just thinking about like what the technology is going to be, which you have a capable, access to um, and then just always knowing like what what you want the purpose of it to be that is a foundational thing for us um, and and even if you don't have like natural language processing and things like that that there's still a way to try it out um, even on a smaller scale as we're on the topic of technology uh, how were you able to, can you comment any on the authentication process for the personalization? I think that's especially related to Aiden, federal student need. 
Yeah, so personalization, given that, as I mentioned, we built our chatbot within our um, FedRAMP and cloud environment. Um, once you log in, Aiden shows up. So you're already within our environment. So we are able to connect to our legacy systems through API. So everything is safe and secure. It's using authentication um, tool, what we call is our, our FSA ID, your username and password with, F, uh, with federal student aid, pretty much your account with our agency. So that was in our mind, very simple and straightforward because again, we already have an authenticated, uh, authentication mechanism. And it's just about the same way you will log into the site to get access to your account information. Aiden will show up and do the same exact thing. So for us, it was a, it was a simple solution in terms of building our chatbot within our FedRAMP cloud environment. We have a whole cluster of questions here about integrations. Um, some folks have asked about the chatbots and whether or not they feed into your customer relationship management system. Also some questions about the integration with call centers and email responses to customer questions. Um, can you um, speak to the integration a bit more? Yes, uh, we, we use Salesforce in the back end for our CRM for our contact centers. As I mentioned in that example, where we actually do a warm handoff between Aiden to the live chat agent, that's all integrated uh, where we do that handoff over to Salesforce and they have a transcript of the conversation. We are building as part of our product roadmap to have a more deeper integration with Salesforce. I'm hoping at some point Salesforce has the Einstein bot also available as it's FedRAMP compliant. But again, it's, um, it's a part of our product roadmap. It can be done. We are doing it today. So again, for our solution, Salesforce, and then that conversation when we do a live handoff or a warm transfer to a live agent um, within the, the chat window, live chat, um, that's all integrated through Salesforce. And we also use, just real quick, we also use for our, what we call knowledge articles, the content. That all resides in Salesforce. So it's just an API call. We have all that content in our Salesforce platform. When you ask a question about, hey, what is a Pell Grant? That's pulling it from Salesforce. It's a knowledge article. And again, it's just that integration that we said, hey, our content is going to reside there. So that way it's just a simple API pull and Aiden can pull that content. I know the scams and TSA are both heavily related to FAQs that you're receiving. Um, are, have the chatbots completely replaced your FAQs? No, not at all. Um, they still operate separately and the pages that they operate on that we have our chatbot live on are on the related pages of how to report a scam or the most common scams and frauds. And just what we found is that people may not necessarily read the content and they want to know the action very quickly. And so this is a way to, you know, provide that information and actionable information. But our knowledge base is that PowerUSA.gov are not in any way uh, connected with our chatbot at this time. I know that's something that we like, definitely would like to be able to explore. And we've proven out the case of using chatbots, but they're definitely, definitely separate entities. And we don't have integration with our chat, um, our contact center um, at this time. But I think that's also on our wish list in the coming days and years. So no, ours did not replace the FAQs as well. The FAQs are still there using the thought process that everybody communicates differently. We try to touch every element there is in order to make sure that we can communicate with you the way you wish to be communicated. Um, and as far as being integrated with the call center, we are not integrated with the call center. Um, we are using the ClareBridge platform right now. Uh, they are capable of doing that. Um, our issues would be, would be more political and internal. So we haven't been able to put that all together as we'd like to do, but it is on our bucket list of things to try to do so that we can have a one-stop shop uh, and to turn it over. And, and then just to back up a little bit, if you are using my bot, and for some reason, your the bot is not giving you what you need and you want to talk to a person or you're just old fashioned and you want to talk to a person, then you can at any point in there type in that you want to talk to an agent and one of the agents will, you'll just fall into the queue and we will we'll chat back with you through social media.
I'm scanning through the other questions here and seeing kind of what the next <laughs> logical question follow up to that is. Um, one question from the chat is regarding iteration on the bots and how you're identifying additional content areas or uh, making tweaks to provide additional either answers or content. We have, we launched a second bot set of bots um, last year, about a year ago actually, for voting questions. We get so many questions about voting topics and issues and based on what we had learned about um, from our experience with the scams one, we thought that we'd try a voting version of it. And there's, um, it came in great use in just one year. We had, um, I think 272,000 uses versus we only had 94,000 uses of the scam spot in two years. And we had 272,000 uses of the voting ones. Um, and I think we were able to, we, two things, we had user testing, which helped us understand what challenges people had with the, our first bot, um, as far as like recognizing a link or forgetting that the link was there because the, the message scrolled up. And so reiterating answers um, of what link they need to go to, um, making it the really straightforward questions because voting is really complex um, to get to their state uh, office. Um, I think those are, it was a great opportunity. Voting was a lot of peace is last year for sure. And I know that we couldn't have been able to handle such an influx of questions um, with all the different intricacies. So being able to handle, again, those really uh, tier one kinds of questions of where to register to vote, where to change my registration, um, really was a great way to expand the chat bot for us last year. And here at Federal Student Aid, I think, uh, I think everyone here would agree content is king. Without content, the chat bot's not going to work. I mean, it's it's very straightforward, ask a question, provide a response. And when we started our journey, um, we did it just like GSA did and TSA, look internally like what the type of questions were coming in across different parts of the organization, whether it's a website, survey, or contact centers. And we started with a very first MVP with some of the top questions coming in and develop our content there. My thought was I can't boil the ocean. I need to start with a small subset and then let our customers, again, human center design principles. Let our customers tell us what type of content they want to hear based on the questions that they're asking. So as we started off with 10% of users, then 30% of users, then 50, then to 100%, we learned where our gaps were. I have somebody from our content team and social media team that kind of works with me to kind of look at the content and write the content that's needed because through the data, we identify if folks are asking question X and it's the top 10 and we don't have a response, guess what? We need to create the content, draft it, put it into our Salesforce environment, do the API call, build the intent, do some sample utterances to train the bot, and then boom, ship it and see, what, um, see if that um, actually solves some of the questions. And yes, sometimes our hypothesis works. It actually hits and solves um, the, the customer inquiry. Sometimes, guess what? It doesn't, and we have to fine tune it. So it's about experimentation. I look at it, there's no failure in any of this. It's about experimenting. You might have a hypothesis that pans out great. If it doesn't, find out why it didn't pan out. Keep asking your, um, your, your customers, look at the data, and then keep moving forward and refine it. And so with TSA, the good thing is, is that either you can bring it or you can't. So there's not really a lot to expand upon unless something new came up, which will probably be face masks, but let's hope that's temporary. What I will tell you that I'm looking at doing is I'm exploring and using a bot to listen for me because where I'm going next is, is trying to understand more what our customers are saying, but they're not saying to us. So that's the new, um, we'll call it road that I'm on and I'm exploring, but I haven't done it yet. Um, if you talk to me about six months to a year from now, I'll tell you how it worked. Keith asked us in the chat, uh, does your chat bot also tell your users when it doesn't know the answer? Yes. Yes. It tells us to rephrase it. And after, I believe I have it set up for three attempts, if it fails, it directs them okay. Let's um, try to uh, connect you with one of our call centers so that way they can answer your question. So yes, we do have an intent flow to direct them to a customer service representative. 
And similar, we're the same way. You get three tries, exactly. Or if at any time you cannot get the answer, like I said, you can just say agent. And um, one of our, our customer service reps will come on and will answer the question. Um, but once again, going with the concept of is yes or no. And if it's not yes or no, and you have some strange question, um, you know, can I bring uh, my Edward Scissorhands hands on a plane, which would not be a yes or no answer, you're going to get directed to an agent so that we can answer the question. And we don't have that capability because we don't have um, typing capability throughout the bot. Um, and so that's not, it's just really, you have to respond to one of the questions. And if you don't, then um, there's no uh, follow-up answer, so. Pulling a little bit more on this thread, um, as questions are asked, how are you handling mismatches with answers that have been cleared? If any of you were able to address that question. Yeah. Is Abraham all our every piece of content that we put on Aiden has been cleared. So if we can't map to the utterance or the question the customer is asking, then again it goes to that intent where this at any point in time, just like the TSA, they could ask for human agent and we'll provide it with the list of contact centers. Um, same thing if we're not responding, we'll tell you to the contact center. But every piece of content is cleared. So again, it's a it's a lot of processes behind the scenes that I work with our contact folks to make sure that if there's a gap or um, our content is not hitting the mark, then we rewrite it. It goes through the formal process. It's been vetted. Boom. It puts it gets put into our Salesforce CRM. We connect to the API and we ship it. Same thing. Uh, all the content is cleared. Anything we're going to tell you, you can read on the front page of the Washington Post. Uh, comes straight out of public affairs. And so um, there's nothing that we're going to miss. Yeah, we don't have like a mismet because we're not using like a language processing, you know, mechanisms like uh, federal student aid is. So hopefully it matches their need. And if not, we have messaging, like if this doesn't answer your question, you know, visit or search USA.gov or call our contact center um, for more information. And, and if I could just come back for a moment, that's the whole uh, key to the CSAT score of, from the bot at the end of the, the uh, engagement with the customer. Did we meet your expectations or did we answer your question? If we didn't, then we know right away that we didn't do it. But we're running a very good CSAT score. We usually run within the 90 percentile, which is better than um, most airlines do. So I, I think we're hitting the mark pretty good. And that's really great. I know it's something that we do have a flow intent to give feedback, a thumbs up and a thumbs down and a quick uh, uh, expert or whatever you want to say. But we noticed that that usage is not very high. So we're exploring different ways to make that more prominent. Um, so it's, it's something that we get feedback, but it's not the usage that is going to give us any meaningful feedback to make improvements. So that's something that I'm currently, hopefully this year, I can tweak it to hopefully make it more prominent, not too intrusive, but to get that feedback. And that's another measure, I think back to the question that was posed earlier, another measure to, um, to determine success if people are giving you either thumbs up, thumbs out, how, or what, however you want to measure it. Having that within the chat experience is something definitely to have to share with leadership. Beyond the customer experience and customer satisfaction feedback, what other methods are you using to um, assess the user experience? Um, one thing that I do um, is that we do usability testing. Um, anytime we launch a new feature, um, depending within our product design team schedule, we do usability testing on aid and on, you know, with actual users just to observe if the, first of all, the user experience itself makes sense. And also, are we responding to your questions? So you might have all the data and metrics and those are, are the good quantitative that you definitely wanna have in within your operational reports, but that qualitative data by observing somebody using your product, I mean, I'm telling you, you learn so much. And, I, and, and, and just for me, I deal with the product every day. I'm gonna miss things because I'm so used to it. But when you have an actual customer use 
your, your product through usability testing. And we do it through Teams for folks that um, even in a remote environment, we're able to do Teams on the desktop and on mobile devices. So again, that's just another plug. Like you can always do usability tests no matter in the times that we live in. But watching them, I'm telling you, you learn so much and just gives you a different perspective. So that's another way to measure um, how customers are engaging with your products. I agree. We did usability testing after um, six months with our chatbot. And to, it, I agree completely. Seeing people use it, you're like, this is right there. But them trying to work through a scenario like this is real life to them or, you know, a, a simulation of it versus me just in my head of how this should work or why you think you should go this down this path or down this route. And seeing that um, is really informative and, you know, making you see where there are gaps. Um, also, we just go back to also the interviews. We did interviews with like 32 people who had been victims of scams, um, who we had conversations with and cross-referencing back to like the challenges that they said they were trying to face or trying to address. Um, I think that helps us just keep the reality of like, is this helping people report scams? Is this helping people really find which agency, which is, you know, a top task of not knowing where to file a complaint. And so um, those two pieces really play a role for hopefully improving or providing a good customer experience for us. Abraham, I, oh, go ahead, Janice. Oh, no, I was just going to go, we, we do spot testing, um, you know, to see what's going on. There are enough people in public affairs, because that's where I'm based in, that every now and again we'll try it. And if something's not working right, um, I, we can know about it right away. Um, and then the last thing is that looking, once again, it's back to the listening, and because we can see the thread of what's going on from the bot, the whole conversation. So if something isn't going right, we know to look into it. And I have a supervisor who does that. What made you decide to either name or not name your bot? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting, real quick story for us. Um, uh, back when we started working on this in 2019, I also reached out to Marianetta when I was doing kind of research of just getting into the space. Um, when we did our, you know, we talked to customers similar to, to the GSA team, um, doing interviews and asking them, you know, as part of our research, we knew that um, if we were going to name it, we wanted to make sure that we crafted a persona. We actually developed a persona for Aiden. It's based off a CSR. We did also interviews with CSRs. We did it because they were talking to our customers. We actually talked to customers too. So we developed the Aiden persona um, to be this gender neutral, as you see with the L icon and everything, where it's there to assist you. We're here at the uh, Aiden's here to, is here to assist you. And, and when we started with the name, we actually had different names, but one thing that we knew, we wanted to make sure that we didn't get in trouble with any trademarks. So all the ideas that we had, we actually went and looked at USPTO to make sure it was in trademark. And then we had a lot of names that we had to narrow it down. And luckily one of our choices, Aiden, you know, financial aid, Aiden play a word there, wasn't taken. So we jumped on it immediately. Once we got the blessing from leadership, I worked with our attorneys, filed the trademark, and it took us about almost close to a year to get the trademark for the name and the owl icon. We finally got the trademark late last year for both the name and the um, icon. So again, if you are thinking about doing this, um, please uh, make sure you, you cross your T and dot your I because the last thing you want to do is get into a legal fight with another organization and make sure you check USPTO first before kind of finalizing your name and move on to submitting the application as soon as possible. I'll speak. Um, we had a different name for our chatbot at the launch and we were told we had to change it. Um, and so be very, very, all that research is super important and um, we ended up landing on USA Gov bot um, because it is our brand. Um, but I, yeah, I'm so glad that Abraham and his team did so much research and went forward with the, um, the paperwork and, you know, approvals and patents and such, because it causes more headache, especially if you've gone forward with trying to brand it one way, and then some, um, some decisions are made that you have to change it. So 100% to that. But I think it does for the purpose. I think it does provide a personality of sorts to the to the bot. Um, I know we also we don't have necessarily developing a persona or you know um, a user story, but we definitely wanted our bot to sound like friendly, like oh I'm so sorry you lost money. Let me check for you. Um, 
oh, uh, it doesn't look like you're going to get your money back. And so even with it not being a, an actual name, quote unquote, for ours, like it had been initially, we still had that inflection of personality or, or empathy, um, particularly for the scams topic where, you know, someone has normally been a victim of something. So um, there's that. So um, kind of like Abraham, I wanted to name that bot. Um, and I started out by asking my team, what do you think we should name the bot? I never got it up the chain to ask anybody because there were so many names and so much passion behind what that name should be. Uh, I, I just decided just let it be a bot. It was just that much easier. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate that, um, Abraham, for telling me how you did it. If I ever decide to give life to the bot, I, I will make sure I follow your steps. Also, for those of you who are interested in it, we've recently published an article on digital.gov um, that talks about federal student aids, aid in virtual assistant, and there is a nice subsection there on why the name was selected. So I'll give a plug for that article on digital.gov where you can learn more about this topic. We are close to wrapping up, so I'm gonna hit a few more topic areas here. One is regarding uh, information storage and policy. Are there any provisions around uh, PII and other sensitive information, personally identifiable information and other sensitive information? I'll go first. So if we're gonna have, we're on social media, let's be real, nothing's private. But if we need to ask you personal information, which will usually go around TSA pre-check, then we're gonna take you to a private chat. That way, none of your information is showing up. We do not retain any of that information around your personal information. However, all the information is stored within the platform itself. So if we need to go back to it for some reason, for government reasons, we can. But uh, no. And then I, I think that question also went with SS, SSI, which TSA calls that sensitive information. Um, there is nothing out there that you can't read on the front page of the Washington Post, once again, or any local newspaper. So there is nothing secret that's, that's out there as well. Our bot doesn't store any information. Like We can go back to a chat, but as far as like personal information, we don't have and we can't or separate out one chat to a, to a specific person. So it's just, um, once it's in for data uh, analysis, it's just aggregated. Um, so we don't track it to one particular person. We don't even know who it is, um, IP addresses or anything, so. And for us, since ours is more of a personalized, I put in the link to our product page. It kind of talks about some of the frequently asked questions. We're following the same policies, like the same way you log into your account. We have our privacy notices. We actually, as we were developing them, the product, we added aid into our privacy no, um, notice page. So that way customers are aware of the type of information that we're collecting. It's pretty much the same thing. Like you call into a call center or a customer record goes into our, our, our system. So for us, given that for this time around, Aiden is available to just authenticated users to log into our account, the same cybersecurity policies and proto uh, protocols and our privacy notices, Aiden is covered under that. Have any of you created a chatbot for internal use by your agency employees? No. I see in three head shakes. Yeah. <laughs> three head shakes no on that question, um, which we had a couple of plus ones to in the chat. So perhaps next year or the following year, we'll be having another panel discussion with agencies who have explored that area. I think a good wrap up question here would be regarding uh, lessons learned. What are your lessons learned and how are you applying them to improve either the chatbot or your agency customer services overall? Um, I'll take that real quickly here. Um, lessons learned, I think the key thing here is um, don't be afraid to experiment. I mean, you'll hear that me, you'll hear that from me in several different presentations I've done with GSA. I think you have to experiment. When it's all said and done, we're here to provide services to our citizens. 
And in our worlds in Federal Student Aid, you know, our financial aid programs are complex. We know it. We have a lot of content on our site. Um, and we have to figure out ways of how to digest that content, digest our programs to make it easy for folks to understand, given their experiences with private industry, which is, you know, nine out of 10 times very simple and straightforward. So in tackling um, chatbots or AI, experiment, you know, work with your leadership, let them know, hey, this is not going to be perfect at launch. It's an MVP. And let's experiment. Give me the bandwidth to experiment. Sometimes I'll get it right. Sometimes I will learn. These are the opportunities. There's no such thing as failure. As long as the bot is up and running, um, it's working and you're getting data. You're getting data to help improve the customer experience. So again, be perseverant, have that mindset of experimentation and don't fear, don't fear failing because in my world, there's no such thing as failing. It's all about experimentation. Piggybacking off of Abraham, I'm going to say um, from my lessons learned, the first thing is, is that just because nobody else has it doesn't mean you can't do it. So I, I agree with Abraham a, a lot on that. Um, I, I think the other thing, too, is that you really need to know what it is that you're trying to solve and to make sure that you can solve that. Because if you remember, I said there are a lot of companies out there. Um, they all do the same thing, but different things. So if you know what it is you're trying to solve um, and you solve that problem, then everything else is just gravy. And the last thing is, is that make sure you can show a return on your investment in some manner so that whoever you work for, whatever it is they want, whether they want to be the best or they want to save money or you're trying to save FTEs or you just need to you know, impress your customers a little bit more, but whatever that thing is, that you achieve that thing. Yeah, I um, agree with what both of my uh, panelists, uh, co-panelists said. Um, I would definitely say think about metrics early on um, instead of trying to figure out a, how you're gonna measure it later on. Um, think about if you're gonna do a multilingual or bilingual early on, we did launch um, versions of our bots in Spanish. Um, and so you have to think about you know, do you want it to be the same? Or if you have content that would be able to be used in a Spanish or French or whatever language you want it to be, um, taking that into account and do you have resources to create it? And just being resourceful, like our, we did not come with a chatbot team. Our office, you know, it's a cross section who worked on this team uh, across our tech team. Um, I was on the research side, someone from the content team. And we just, we just put our heads down and made it work. And we weren't you know, perfect, um, but we figured it out. We used what we had. Our um, social media uh, management system had a chatbot feature built in. And so when things we thought were gonna be blocked or we couldn't do it, we used what we could in order to launch and to learn and you know, prove out again the case that chatbots are a viable um, solution for our office and you know, experience for our customers. So. And I completely agree with that real quickly is like, I don't have a dedicated team, you know, I, you know, working, I was prior to this role, I was the chief of staff for our customer experience office. And while I was doing that role, um, our chief customer experience officer, hey, Abraham, I want you to, you know, work on this chatbot solution. We're thinking about it. I want you to go work on it. So to Marina's point, I actually worked with folks across our social media team, our content team, volunteering their time and data analytics. I had a, a data scientist from a different department that kind of helped me, you know, do all the NOU side of the house. So again, look for people who have the same passion and interest around serving citizens with, with, with tech. And then again, as things grow, now I was able to justify a full-time hire to have somebody manage this as, as a PL. So I actually hired somebody recently that hopefully in the next several months, they can um, help me out on become the full-time product owner. So again, I started off small, but once I made the justification and saw the early success, I was able to get an FTE to be dedicated to the work. Thank you all for your passion. It shined right through uh, during all of your answers today. So I really appreciate the time you took to share your experiences standing up chatbots and virtual assistants with us and the web managers community. Um, for those of you who aren't members of the web managers community yet, I encourage you to go to digital.gov communities and sign up to become a community member of this community or any others that are of interest to you. And uh, this video will also be posted on digital.gov's YouTube channel. So 
take a look in a few days and yeah, and take a look and <laughs> use this information to make the case to stand up uh, some of this type of work in your own agencies. So thanks again, and we'll see you again soon.